Welcome to Eternal Journey, the podcast. What is up, everyone? Welcome back for another episode of Eternal Journey, the podcast that talks about all things eternal with a focus on limited play. I'm your host, Jedi, aka Caesar the Crowd Pleaser. And this week for episode 28, we're going to be doing a Trials of Grodov first impressions. I have about uh, 10 to 12 drafts underneath my belt. I think I don't have the format figured out by no means, but I have a decent understanding of it. And so I'm going to share those thoughts with you guys. And hopefully it'll help you improve your game as well. Rack up those seven win deck lists. So... First things first, though, I want to go ahead and mention our YouTube channel. That is EJ the Podcast on YouTube. That's where you can see this podcast, as well as check out various content I produce, such as draft videos, constructive videos, tournament reports, and all that good stuff. So definitely go out there, check it out, and you can catch my content offline if you aren't able to catch me live. Speaking of live, I stream every Sunday, Monday, Tuesday mornings on twitch.tv slash jedi underscore ej so come hang out let me know what you think about this draft format let me know what your top picks are and things like that i'd love to hear about it all right next thing i'd like to once again give a shout out to our latest subscribers and the people that help support the channel and the content i create and this week's subscriber is zero ben zero ben you rock you're one of the first people to send the subscription my way or sub, so I really appreciate the support. <clears throat> it's always great having you hang out in Twitch chat, so keep up the good work. You're greatly appreciated, and you rock. All right, guys, that's it. So let's go ahead and go into our pack one, pick one. Once again, if you're watching this on YouTube, you're able to see the actual pack. Uh, for our comments, we have Fragility, Fend Off, Nimble Conscripts, the 3-4, Soldier for three and a red has reckless and shift one solid aggressive card still a great player in this in this format we have streets of flames there we go three power three and a red fast spell for three damage and a scout awesome card awesome card needle spitter not really excited about Kosul curator blood nurse which is kind of back and forth the one one shaman for one and a purple and you could tw pay two to twist it to create a one one vampire bat with flying and life steal. And mute silence to enemies for four power at fast speed. Uh, I think it's pretty simple and clear. Streets of Flames here. I could see an argument for conscripts or blood nurse, but Streets of Flames just does everything you want all the time, just about. So we're taking Streets of Flames. On the uncommons, we have Chemo Blueprint, which uh, I don't really feel like there's enough weapons in this format obviously except if you have cannon that really kind of warrants the tutor it does give you a plus one plus one to that weapon should you trigger onslaught so there are some combos and synergies but eh uh illicit armament which is the give your relic weapon plus four plus two slow spell for two and purple and if we're not taking blueprints i feel like illicit armament is kind of similar and even a little worse the buff is bigger but you have to have the weapon and be able to play the weapon and play illicit armament so we have Adolescent Deathjaw. This is the 3-2 Dinosaur for 2 in a time. And Shift 3, you may put an exhausted enemy unit into its owner's hand. Uh, this card's good. Uh, it is a 2-drop, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But sometimes the bounce effect is quite relevant. You get to drop a weapon or something off of a unit. It's not bad. And then our rare is Talir Sanctum, which, yeah, we're just not going to go into it. Long story short, you can get to play additional power each turn for three. It's not a thing limited. So I think it's between Death Jaw and Streets of Flames. And for me, I like Streets of Flames. It's a fast spell. So sometimes you have the potential of getting a two for one out of it. It's Scout, so it cleans up your draws and sometimes triggers other effects. Yeah, Streets of Flames, you're the one. All right, sweet guys. So that is our pack one pick one for the week. Pretty straightforward. Like I said, we've been drafting this format for quite a little bit, or at least these packs. So not spending too much time breaking down each pick like we used to. But that is it. So let's go ahead and dive into our main topic, which is our first impressions on Trials of Grodog or set 6.5 or format, I should say. 
And uh, for those of you that are just joining us, they initially just did a revamp of the curated pack. So packs two and three were revamped. We are still drafting Dark Frontier packs one and four. And so, yeah, uh, first things first, I want to go ahead and say that I don't necessarily feel like this was a complete overhaul of the format like we saw in set 5.5 where new synergies arose and like you kind of entirely drafted the set in a whole new way um i think here it's more of just an amplification and modification of the previous format you're still able to draft the same archetypes with an addition of a couple and the decks have changed because the fixing is great so <clears throat> As a whole, I believe the format is significantly slower now. I see a lot less aggressive decks that are just raffle stomping you or you are your opponent. I'm not saying they don't exist. They are there. Obviously, if it's open, it's open. But I'm seeing a lot less of that. I feel like I am not completely dead if I don't have a two drop. Versus in the previous format with Stone Scar and Rakano being so oppressive and even Praxis at some point. Um, you did have the chance of just having the fun police show up and ruin your day if you decide to go too big, too slow. I think part of that is because, once again, the fixing is great. They really upped the fixing in the create packs, giving us common fixing power. They gave us the cargos, which are tri-color fixing. They gave us uh, all the strangers back. So we have plenty of things. We have Trailmaker and we have uh herbalist season herbalist all help us kind of get to our colors and so that made a really big difference where you are able to play three factions fairly consistently and i've seen up to five color decks so i think the fact that people are trying to do all these crazy things with their colors means that they're sometimes not able to play on curve or at the very least they're splashing for more like five color good stuff which raises their curve closer to the four and five range and so the format as a whole is slower so you're able to do more things it kind of coincides right so yeah five colors is a thing three colors is the norm it feels like and i've seen plenty of four color as well uh, that being said two color jacks are still extremely viable i actually put up a seven and oh win uh streak the other day doing a straight combray list with surprisingly minimal interaction i only ended up having four spells in the deck and uh picked up two horns of plenty and just all the units were there all the best combra units were coming my way so i decided to take those excuse me and before i know it i just had 22 23 units that i didn't want to cut i was lacking some uh some spells so i said why not and we went ahead and ran it and we went the distance on it i think we were just able to gum up the board enough and kind of overpower our, our opponents and so we got there using those key interactive spells at very key tipping points um so it worked out so yeah two colors is still completely viable don't feel like you have to always go three or four color good stuff and take all the best cards sometimes if it works with your color and you can clean up your fixing you know and that does clean up some slots if you don't have to take a seek power or a cargo to make sure things happen uh, talking about taking up slots the one modification that it has <clears throat> yeah so drafting there's two things i feel like you can do when you draft uh, the first option is to remain completely open in your pack one i've done that once or twice where you're just kind of taking what the best card is period regardless of, of what you know you're putting in there with a little bit of a mind to double influence cards uh, for example when we talked about Chemo's blueprints it's double justice versus maybe streets of flames or the um the snap jaw death jaw being single time so keep that into consideration but just keep taking the best cards in the pack maybe having a little bit of synergy to the factions and then when you get into packs two and three you identify what fixing is there and what you're being passed so you can lock in your colors or your primary colors in that pack another option is to go very streamlined and try to take one color in pack one you know maybe the occasional other off color and then see and then really kind of prioritize that kind of fixing in pack two and three essentially adding your third color to your deck there and 
Yeah, so long story short, you can stay extremely open pack one. And then that way pack two and three dictate where your draft goes. And then you use pack four to kind of clean up your deck, fill in any holes or gaps you might have had. Or you can start to build your deck in packs one if things are open, i.e. in that Combre deck, it just Combre was being passed was clear as day. And so I had really no incentive to try to go too far off the beaten path. So I stayed on Combre in packs two and three and was just looking for fixing for a third color and I did pick up some third color stuff, but nothing that really felt that I needed to damage or hurt my power base when I had everything I needed in two colors. And so that's the other option where you start to draft like you normally would in the last set. And then in packs two and three, you pick up any additional fixing to splash additional power cards you get there. And then who knows, you might hook yourself up for pack four. That's the other thing as well. I think that it is worth valuing some fixing in packs two and three whether you need it or not for the potential payoffs in pack four there's still a lot of powerful cards in dark frontier and so if you have the choice of i don't know a medium three drop or maybe a stranger that is in one of your colors plus and you think you may play it then you know take that for the chance of having a little additional fixing bannermen are in there as well for the random fixing and stuff like that Speaking of strangers and bannermen and stuff like that, the fact that these are two drops that you desire, granted they are somewhat vanilla, but the ability to attack on fixing to a unit that you're already going to play is the same thing that we talked about the standards in the last format where putting a spell where your power slot would be is huge to your deck building. And so the strangers offer that fixing ability while just being a regular two drop and have all the cards in your deck two drops are typically the ones that are most interchangeable because you just want the body. And so, you know, maybe losing a little bit of utility out of your two drop, so let's say, for example, a paladin or a herbalist to, or even the uh, duelist to have some fixing can go a long way. That being said, I think because of that, you can kind of deprioritize two drops early primarily in pack one that way in packs two and three you can since you're going to want to take the strangers anyways you have the slots open to pick those up so that's just something to take in consideration that also being said you're able to pick up like all right here's a stranger granted i have not picked up strangers that are completely off color but i also am not that ambitious on my splashes as far as going five colors but i could see that being viable as well where you're like hey i'm stone scar but this is a huru Stranger, why not? Let's take it. Maybe one of the colors will end up working. So I could see that as well. But yeah, keeping your two up shops kind of open in pack one so you can fill them up in two and three is completely a good strategy and viable. Um, moving right along though, we have it is uh, because of so much colors and splashes and things and the strangers sometimes being part of the deck and sometimes just being off color random splashes, it is significantly harder to play around combat tricks. Um, this is no joke because uh, you just you can kind of identify certain tricks, but when they have four colors, oh, they have one power open and they have four colors, right? Well, do they have char? Do they have detain? Do they have furnish? Like these are, you know, do they have flash grenades? So right there, four one power combat tricks came to mind. And so it is extremely difficult to pinpoint what combat trick your opponent may be playing and how to play around it. That means for me, the strategy I've taken that unless I'm able to completely identify specifically what they have, like, okay, it was not a, uh, it, you know stopped in combat but didn't stop at the end of turn or they didn't have a stop until they had exactly four power things like that kind of help you identify a little bit closer to what they may or may not have but i still find it quite difficult to play around so if i can't specifically identify what they might have like a high somewhere between 70 to 90 percent chance of what they have then i just decide not to play around it unless it is a blowout that's the other caveat so those are my two ways like unless i can without a reasonable doubt figure out what they have or if it is a complete blowout then i will just not play around the combat trick or force them to have it because you're going to rock your brain and miss out on opportunities or give your opponent additional opportunities that weren't there just because you were trying to level up them 
So it's kind of that scenario, if you guys have heard me before, where you play around something until you can't, right? If you if you were about to lose, but if you do this attack and they have X, Y, Z or card X, then you just lose. But you're going to lose if you don't make the attack. Well, then you just can't play around card X and you have to just swing. And it's very similar here. The But like I said, you do your threat assessment and if a specific combat trick will completely blow you out, get like a three for one or tip the scales or something like that, then I still try to play around that one until I can get some more information just to avoid the blowout. But if it's one of those things where like, hey, if they have, you know, card Y, then I get two for one. Well, you know, but they could have four other cards, then you just got to have, you just got to make them have it. And I've, I've been fairly happy with that kind of strategy sometimes you do get the two for one that you could have played around but at the same time once again if you aren't able to identify then what are you gonna do play around cards that don't exist for all the game and then give your opponent more chances to draw the card that you're thinking about or other out so playing around combat tricks is significantly harder that being said i do think removal is slightly higher of a premium now than it was uh, viscerate i know a lot of people are low on it i think having one maybe even two in your deck now is a little more feasible because the de the format has slowed down people are taking their time playing beefier units and so just having that unconditional this for sure gets something off the board it's quite relevant i still like retribution a lot i think that card is absolutely amazing it kind of does everything i do feel like in this format i tend to have to sack a unit a little bit more to trigger that uh, retro the the onslaught trigger versus in the previous format and it felt like i had a little more evasion or people were a little more hesitant to block uh once again it goes back to that thing where people since they can't identify what combat trick you have they're just going to kind of make you have it but i still think the card does everything you want uh, it's very strong both on offense and defense and so i don't mind it's easily splashable it being a single justice so i like that card quite a bit and um i'm seeing a lot less gun downs in the format i think it's just a little too conditional with you know once again you have behemoth you have tremor shocker you have uh the accuser so you have all these units that are like really big butts that make it a little bit less likely of you to be able to gun down them as well as fire still being a more aggressive color uh let's see the uh barrel through is awesome barrel through is just great we did lose pummel but i think daring maneuver is more than enough of, of a fine replacement and i like the fact that that you can use on both offense and defense so those cards i take highly barrel through is just great because it's a great pump spell wins combat 90 percent of the time but it also fixes your power or influence which obviously we just talked about is extremely important at, as well there have been times where I've used a barrel through a little aggressively, i.e. to take out a two or three drop simply because I needed the influence. But hey, you still got a card out of it, so it worked out in your favor regardless. As far as the new archetypes work, so I feel like the curated packs added, they made armor matters a little bit more of a thing. They added some bonus cards to spells matter. And then the one new archetype, or I guess two, if you if you want to divvy it up, is the go wide, i.e. token making multiple units off of one card, as well as the sack your own units or sack outlet type decks. Um, I kind of feel like they go hand in hand because they want similar cards. But that being said, they can be different cards as well. Uh, out of all those, the Armor Matters and Spell Matters cards, I really don't think they received enough of a buff to warrant kind of like people playing them more than they should. Uh, really, the payoffs are the same, and that's kind of the problem, really. And so with the payoffs being the same, yes, you have some more enablers, but really, you know, is the juice worth the squeeze, essentially? And because they didn't really up that all that much, it's not, it's not seeing it. That being said, I have seen the sack deck and the go wide deck i feel like i could have drafted it one time but i identified that a little too late and wasn't able to the biggest thing we're seeing obviously is the i always forget the name of it but the one one wisp that when it it dies in tomb you draw a card followed up by the thorn beast 
So the Thorn Beast is a 3-3 shadow. And then if you sack a unit when it comes into play, it becomes a 5-5. Five, five. I've gotten wrecked by this card several times. Having a 5-5 five, five on turn 3 is huge. They draw a card to replace the Wisp anyways. Uh, heaven forbid they should have a Dark Return, which has happened to me as well, where I waste some resources to get the 5-5 five, five off the board, so I'm not taking 15 from it. And then they just Dark Return it back playing as a 6-6 sometimes, or even sacking another unit, making it a 8-8. So yeah, that's the thing, as well as the red spell, sack a unit, deal three damage. That's uh, relevant. Uh, yeah, there, it, just those two kind of strategies as a whole, I feel like have shown quite a bit of payoff. Uh, you know, things like Bellower that when it dies, plus pumps your team. All those kind of things I've seen happen where the go wide strategy is there and it can win you some games. It could have been the matchups, could have not. I don't know. Let me know in the comments below if you have come across or played the go wide or sack deck and how it's worked out for you. I have yet to see Madness. I don't remember if Madness is in the format. Maybe it's not. Uh, I know Scream is, but yeah, I think that's fun. I've seen... Primarily, I see it in Stone Scar, uh, but it is there. It is there. You just have to be willing to really audible into it because you see it in packs two and three. Uh, a couple of small interactions. Uh, oh, wait, Flyers. Flyers are still pretty solid as well. Uh, I actually think they've gone up in value just because, like I said, being a slower fa format, there are more board stalls. And so once you get to a parity board state, no one's really attacking. His evasive units are the ones that are going to do it. In my games, I have realized that several times we have won or lost based on whether someone has a flyer. And it doesn't even need to be that big of a flyer. The, and it could definitely get there. If you end up landing and sticking a strong flyer, chances are you're going to take it down. So... Flying has definitely gone up a little bit. It was always good, but it's definitely gone up in value. Um, trying to think if I've seen Huru Flyers. I think I might have gone Huru Flyers one time. It wasn't that strong of a deck, but it ended up it was a winning record. Frost Elements was obviously awesome. Storm Sprite is great. That's that's the real payoff there. Being able to loot and pump it. The but yeah, flyers are great. If you're able to stick one, it just gets you there. I, I can't tell you how many times I've lost to a, a plover or even a humbug that was twisted once and stuff like that. So keep that in mind. Save some removal and things like that for those flyers because when the board is extremely gummed up with all kinds of units, the evasion, evasive units is what's going to get there. That also makes us revisit the whole shift mechanic. And in most often than not now I've seen unless you're losing and you need the blocker it is almost 100% correct to go ahead and shift a unit for the incremental damage that you get when it does emerge uh, it just adds up over time it really does and it makes racing uh, scenarios a lot more uh, beneficial I guess or rewarding when you're, you, your opponent is already at a lower life total and lets you sometimes kind of sneak wins in occasionally when you are able to have pump spells because once again bottoms up mighty strikes cannon those are all in the format and so all those can win <clears throat> a game out of nowhere which i have been on both sides of all three of those and it is absolutely wonderful and absolutely horrible all at the same time so yeah that is something to take in consideration so let's go ahead and touch on that a little bit Mighty Strikes, Cannon, Heretic Cannon, and Bottoms Up are all fantastic picks. They can win the game out of nowhere like we just said. So if you see those and can play them, I definitely highly, highly suggest taking them. Um, the one, both Cannon and Bottoms Up are easy to splash, seeing being requiring only a single fire influence. Mighty Strikes is a little harder just because it is two color and a little more expensive, but the fact that it does grant Overwhelm is a huge bonus and it can go on multiple units so yeah mighty strikes is a solid thing as well sometimes the cool thing about mighty strikes is that bottoms up typically has to win you the game that turn the, the turn you play it cannon uh you probably get a turn or two before your opponent really has to like has to deal with it mighty strikes though sometimes can win you the game 
three turns before you win because you attack aggressively or they attack you aggressively you block and then you're able to mighty strike two maybe even three of your units to take out you know their three most powerful units deal some damage and then you have a significantly stronger board presence than they do now their board was decimated and now you're able to attack freely without repercussions and win the game that way so mighty strikes it being a little harder to cast and a little more expensive does give it some more flexibility and versatility which makes it a great pickup uh so yeah be on the lookout for those cards those cards are awesome i think when you can play them definitely do once again uh, both cannon and bottoms up synergizes really really well with flyers Another little interesting interaction uh, on those things is Mighty Strikes and Cannon. Cannon triggers on attack, and there is no window for you to do it. Like for those of you that play Magic, you can't like declare attackers, see if they do anything, and then before the trigger from Cannon happens, Mighty Strike. So if you are going to Bottoms Up or Mighty Strikes your Cannon target, make sure you do it before combat or before you declare them attackers so you get the full bonus out of it. Just a small little tip that could come up sometimes if you're not really paying attention or haven't seen that interaction before. Next up is the Wanted Poster and Retribution. I uh, will admit I learned this the hard way. I had, I, was, I believe it was the Combray deck actually. So I had a dead shot, which is the 2-2 two, two for 2 that you can twist for 3 to stun a unit. Or I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I, I got them mixed up. I apologize. I apologize. The Headhunter is the 2-1 you to drop injustice where you can twist it to put a excuse me wanted poster on a unit so i had a horner plenty out so i was able to twist luckily i don't think i twisted twice i think i just did it once and then i had the retribution to kill their whatever i think it was a conscripts loaded up with a machete so a five six right <laughs> And so I was like, cool, I'll put the haunted poster on it this turn. And the next turn, I'll retribution it and draw some cards. Or, you know, I think I did it both at the same time. Well, the silence effect happens before it dies. And of course, for those of you that know, when a silence effect goes on, I should have known better, honestly. And I, I just thought about it but a little bit too late. But once again, the silence effect will silence everything on the unit, not just friendly units or, or enemies or what, et cetera, like curses, but it silences everything. So, the machete was silenced, the conscript was silenced, and the wanted poster was silenced. So, Retribution did kill the unit, but I drew no cards. Oh, it wasn't a conscript, it was a sharpshooter. That's what it was, a sharpshooter with a machete. So it was a 5-5 five, five quick draw. So yeah, word of the wise, keep that in mind. That is definitely an interaction that you have to uh, be careful about so you don't mess up and cost yourself a card. I mean, luckily it didn't cost me a card, but it did cost me some tempo and power. There was another interesting interaction that I thought about. I don't remember what it was now. I should have written it down. It came up on stream, but it, long story short, it was, um, if I remember correctly, as far as like a vague interpretation of it, it was based on the stacking of triggers and when they happen. And so that's why I think it was better off to tell you guys because uh, Eternal will kind of take of its own, it, it stacks the triggers however it wants. And so you're not able to, I think the interaction was less beneficial than if the triggers were stacked the other way. So I should have written it down to let you guys know. But uh, if it does come up again, I will make sure to pass that information along to you guys. Uh, but yeah, those are little kind of quick takes on that portion of it. All right, guys. So in closing on my initial impressions of Trials of Grodoff draft format or set 6.5 i i like it i think it is somewhat similar so you don't feel like you're learning an entirely new format but it is different in the fact that the fixing is there to make decks a lot more a lot wider and so it is fun it changed it up enough where it is exciting and fresh i think you should draft what you like what makes you happy because it is all viable now uh, i think fire took a slight step down just slight and uh, primal went up a notch essentially so that's viable too because of the flyers i don't know just something about it just kind of clicked together i'm not sure if it, it's the more stun effects in primal or whatnot but it just kind of comes together quite nicely now i still don't think you want to be primarily primal but 
It has it's a great support color on other things. My personal favorite is still Justice. I feel like Justice does everything you want to do between flyers and evasive units and removal, combat tricks and things like that. So I like Justice quite a bit. I typically fall back to it if I think it's ever even slightly open or remotely open. And then um yeah, I think it's great. I'm excited. I'm going to keep drafting it and I will give you guys an up to date on what's going on with it. Stay tuned. Next week, I will be doing the uh, Sunset Show for set five or set six because why not? I feel like the format is different enough where it warrants it. So we will do that. And yeah, so that's my initial impressions on the format. I like it. I hope you like it too. Let me know in the comments below and uh, catch me live on my stream. Let me know what you think there. So moving on to our what's the play for the week. This one is brought to you by Patumaro from the Farming Eternal podcast. This is the other limited podcast uh, on Eternal. They are great. Patumaro, Ben Gracier, and Barefoot Farmer. They do a fantastic job. If you guys do end up getting a seven win deck list, shoot it over to them at Farming Eternal at Gmail. And they collect all the data to into a spreadsheet so we have solid concrete mathematical numbers telling us how the format is doing so this one is a little bit of a long one because it's across multiple plays so i will express it to you guys so we are extend fire justice uh primal but tomorrow is geneve so fire time primal there are, we're both at six power this board state they are but tomorrow's at 17. They just finished Avalanche Yetting two of our units, which I'll go over in a minute. They have the uh, mining team in play. They have a 1-3 Blurry Chaser, so it hasn't been twisted. A 1-2 Familiar, the Flying Familiar for time. A 1-4 Surveyor, the Yeti Surveyor that is already merged. An Elysian Stranger, 2-2. Two -two. And then the Ruined Excavator, which is the 4-6 sentinel that you can get back a relic when it is summoned uh, and they're at 17. our side of the board we have a 3-1 blurry chaser a 2-3 lookout the endurance sky crag stranger a the albatross the flying albatross with a plus one plus one so three a three flying albatross we just played our blurry chaser and we are at 15 life patumoro has two cards in hand we have three cards, by the way, of Mighty Strikes, Detain, and a Heretic's Cannon. So we play our Blurry Chaser, putting us down to four, and we scout right off the bat. And <clears throat> so here we see a Fire Sigil, right? And our influence is five Fire, one Justice, two Primal, and for all intents and purposes, that lets us play everything we need to. So we don't need the Fire Influence. The question is, do we keep that on top or not? And I won't do the music this time because like I said, we're gonna go over multiple plays. So would you guys keep the fire on top or not? I went ahead and decided to keep it on top because in my head, we are at six power. Drawing that fire sigil will allow us to play our seventh power, play Heretic's Cannon and swing and still leave up Detain to potentially allow if how tomorrow decides to like triple or quad block something to take out our heretic cannon target or unit we have the detain to change math and so i leave it on top let me know in the comments below if you would have bottomed it or not so moving on to the rest of that so uh, the next part to that is we top we leave it on top right we still have three power left and we have nothing else going on really except the mighty strikes do you attack here with one of your other units and play the mighty strikes to use your power mind you we're at six power so we can mighty strikes twice but we're we've already used three to play the blurry chaser so we only have we can only use it once here or do you scout a second time with blurry chaser to leave the fire sigil back on top but make it a three one right so i think there's arguments for both the longer game means you do not twist your blurry chaser and you leave it to have another potential scout later on or you twist it 
because we've decided that's going to be our cannon target and so i'd rather have as much power on the blurry chaser as possible to capitalize on not only the cannon trigger but also the quick draw and so yeah i went ahead for the aggressive route i think uh mind you they just played the avalanche yeti so our albatross and our three one blurry chaser the blurry chaser that was already in play are both the ones that are stunned so they're out of the game for three turns which made it really bad for us because uh, both those were going to be our premier targets for the cannon so i end up scouting a second time that way because i decided that that blurry chaser is going to be our cannon target uh, and so yeah that's what happens there let me know once again what you guys would have done there if you would have done something different and if you're watching this on youtube you can actually see the board state on the your screen so we go ahead and once again top top scout twice and i believe we do not attack yep so Hatsumaru then ends up making a uh interesting play i mean it's a good play he shifts in cover fire giving the four six double strike and attacks with everything so we decide to instead of taking eight we could have chump blocked as well and then blocked two other units profitably uh at the very least to trade and kill the blurry chaser so yeah so there's another interesting play we'll go over here as well so they literally put the cover fire on the four six and swing with absolutely everything they're tapped out we have the two three lookout the two two stranger and the three one um three one blurry chaser we can either chump block the four six to take to avoid taking eight and then block two other things to trade or get stuff off the board namely the lookout on the blurry chaser to get the blurry chaser off the board right i decide that this is a instead of having to deal with this double damage four six double damage every turn i go ahead and triple block with all our units and use the detain that way i keep all three of my units but we get the four six out of the picture and i don't have to worry about the double damage so that's what we do in the process we take uh two three four five six seven eight we take eight going down to seven okay so we go down to seven then it is our turn they are completely tapped out so we draw that fire sigil now here's the board state and tell me what your play would be so once again we have two more turns before our three one blurry chaser or our albatross are off of the yeti stun we have six power with a fire sigil in hand so seven power we have mighty strikes heretics cannon and then we have our two three lookout our two two stranger and our three one blurry chaser patumaro is tapped out at 17. what do we do so the options so now because we use the detain that's out of the way so sadly drawing that fire sigil was the last thing we needed because it's borderline useless right now but we're also at a precarious seven life and they still have two cards in hand to include two shifted units that could kill us soon so we can <clears throat> leave everything back and wait we can blurry uh we can heretics can the blurry chaser get in for 10 putting them at seven and have two blockers and wait till next turn to mighty strikes them or <clears throat> and mind you neither of our blockers could take out the blurry chaser should they twist we could leave mighty strikes up we can attack with just the lookout and that way we have everything up including my strikes to block aggressively we have multiple options we can do here At the end of the day we decided that the most aggressive and conservative route because we were starting to lose on board and we had a clock because of the two shifted units that were going to be emerged and we're at the seven life so i decide to go ahead and kind of split the ends and put the heretic cannon on the lookout this will allow me to get in for eight damage instead of ten but it leaves all three blockers back and i believe this was the most uh, safe play while still giving me a chance to win the game because after that if we survive this turn we have we are able to double pump the lookout with mighty strikes and then attack for uh 20 damage with overwhelm right so that's what we end up doing 
Let me know if that's the play or if you would have gone with the Blurry Chaser to get an extra two damage and have potential quick draw. So what ends up happening here though, and I'll give Patumara credit, he ended up doing the Death From Above on the Blurry Chaser. So he twisted the Blurry Chaser to 3-1, Death From Above, and then attacked. So between the Familiar and the, and the Berserk on the Blurry Chaser, that is 7 damage and they kill us so needless to say <laughs> patamoro played it great and he took it down but let me know let me know in the comments below or on twitch live you can come hang out let me know what your play would have been there i think there were multiple lines that we could have taken i think the one of the biggest decisions was how we blocked that four six as well as the double scout uh, the double scout might have been the the most kind of controversial to be honest with you just because like scouting the second time was literally just to add one more power granted we had a plan and we were sticking to it but i think keeping the scout open for flexibility purposes might have ended up paying off a little bit um so let me know in the comments below what you guys would have done but that is our what's the play which means we're at the end of our show guys so thank you so much for tuning in once again you can catch me all my content offline online but when i'm offline at ej the podcast on youtube follow me on twitter at ej the podcast so you can find out whenever i go live or post new videos and podcasts and then of course you can come hang out with me live at twitch.tv slash jedi underscore ej every said sunday sunday monday and tuesday mornings all right guys that's gonna do it for me really appreciate it and until next time, happy gaming.